All right, so uh, that just kicked me out of that because I don't know why it doesn't like if you're the only person here talking. Um, but that's what we had to deal with. Hopefully that saved the first little bit there and I can just put that in a separate video because um, I really don't want to have to go over all that again. Um, but maybe I just got to keep a closer eye now on when it's going to kick me off uh, because nobody else is here. Maybe I'll record it another way. But I think we should be okay. I think I could just stitch those two recordings together. So I'm just going to I'm just going to present my entire screen this time. I think it'll be easier for me to pick up if something amiss is happening. All right. So like I said, sports are emerging here. All right. Um, rules are starting to be standardized. Think about it. Now I can communicate if I'm in Cape May Courthouse with somebody in Philadelphia, with somebody in Williamstown, with somebody in Medford. Heck, with somebody, you know, out in Missouri. We have telegraphs. We can communicate almost instantaneously. We can talk about, hey, how do you play baseball? Oh, we play it that way, too, but slightly different. How are we going to make that? You know, how are we going to compromise there? Right. You can do all these things now. You can you can transport your teams to play other teams. OK. So if you want to play another team in another city, first of all, you're going to have to agree on the rules, right? You can't you can't be playing uh, according to different rules. So you're going to have to standardize those rules so the team from, say, Atlantic City can play the team from Philadelphia and be on the same footing. Everybody knows what they're doing, right? So that's going to be an impetus to standardizing the rules. The fact that you can transport these teams to meet each other is going to be an impetus for that. You know, so let's go through some of the sports and how they're changing this period. So baseball. It's a very complicated story. I'm going to simplify it a lot right now. It gradually rounds into the form we know today from basically the 1820s to the 1860s. If you've ever heard the uh, the myth about Abner Doubleday inventing baseball in Cooperstown in 1839, some of you may have heard of this. It's a total myth, total fabrication. Um, I could spend a lot more time getting into it, but we can probably leave it at that for right now. It's a myth. You may have also heard more of a new age explanation. Well, actually, this guy in Hoboken, New Jersey, up by New York, Alexander Cartwright, he invented baseball in 1845, not after a double day. That's also not true either. Baseball really evolves. OK, it doesn't it's not invented. It evolves. We'll talk about that in the next lecture. Uh, football starts to split from soccer and rugby. OK, so rugby's around before what we know is football today. Soccer is, um, although that's also an evolution, too. It's kind of like how. Um, humans aren't evolved from apes. Humans and apes are evolved from a common ancestor, right? So football is not evolved from soccer. Football and soccer are evolved from a common ancestor. So the first college football game in 1869, which is Rutgers versus Princeton, if we were to watch that today, if there were video of it, which there was no video back then, but if there were video, you'd probably say, Mr. Murphy, that's not football. That's like soccer or that's rugby. Well, that's what college football looked like at that time. Okay, and we'll get more into that uh, coming up. Right here's a picture of the 1876 Yale Bulldogs. That's a college football team. Okay. Uh, golf, you know, the first major, uh, if you're into golf, the, which is the British Open or technically the Open Championship, that's 1860. Notice all these dates are kind of similar, right? Um, I'm going to be mentioning a lot of championships here. Again, if you want to have a championship, everybody has to agree in the rules. So if everybody, for everybody to agree in the rules, you have to be able to talk about the rules. You have to, to be able to talk about the rules. You have to have fast communication, right? All these things go together. Uh, so the first lawn tennis club, which is the, like an old fancy word for tennis, 1872. The first Kentucky Derby, which is horse racing, big sport back then, 1875. Um, boxing, if you're into boxing at all, there's these things called the Marcus of Queensbury rules, which kind of lay out, you know, what's a legal hit and what's an illegal hit in boxing. It takes street fighting into a sport. That comes around 1867. Basketball, you can actually say basketball is invented. Basketball doesn't necessarily evolve. Basketball is invented on one day in 1891. Okay. Uh, so as I mentioned, the top three sports in the late 1800s, if you had to pick three, and I wouldn't say in this order necessarily, but I would say horse racing, boxing, and baseball. As we're getting into the late 1800s, that's what people in America are really into. Not to say that people don't play golf or that people don't play tennis that people don't row but horse racing boxing and baseball in some order are the most popular sports in america okay let me just make sure i'm not going to get kicked out here cool. that's john l sullivan 
on the right there. Um, he's the last heavyweight. Come on. Yes, I know I'm presenting everybody. Last heavyweight bare knuckle boxing champion. And he's the first heavyweight gloved boxing champion. So he transcended both those errors. Uh, he's also famous for being the first million dollar athlete. He was the first athlete to make a million dollars, which a million dollars in the 1880s when he boxed is some more than $20 million today. Right? That's a really big deal. He's one of the first, you could call them sports celebrities out there. So there's other games going on in the city, right? Since all these people are moving to the city, um, they're going to be playing a lot more games there. So Turnverein was really big. And you're like, what, Mr. Murphy, what the heck is Turnverein? It's just a German form of gymnastics. Um, you could basically call it gymnastics. It's not the same thing as gymnastics, but it's pretty close. These were hugely popular, believe it or not, in the 1800s. Um, Germans were really into it. And like I said, German immigration was really high at this time. So you're going to see a lot of turn in the cities. Billiards. Okay. Uh, what you might call pool, although there's a difference between billiards and pool, right? Billiards, or excuse me, pool is just pocket billiards. So where you have a pool table with pockets in it. If you're just playing billiards, there are no pockets on the table. You're playing the rails, you're playing angles, all that stuff. Um, and bowling, like I said, outdoor bowling was big in the 1700s. Bowling moves indoors. After that, becomes big in the city. And a lot of the common denominators these things have is they're able to fit in small areas. Okay, It's kind of hard to be a popular sport in the city if you can't fit in a small area. There's not a whole lot of space to go around the city. Space is very expensive. Right. So you can't necessarily have a lot of it. There's a reason why football isn't super popular in big cities. You know, at the youth level, it's played, but it's usually not the most popular sport. It takes up a lot of space. Billiards, I can put three pool tables in a room and call it a day. I, you know, I have plenty of room for that. Bowling, I can have a small bowling alley with six lanes, call it a day. I can't have a 25 yard football field. Right. It doesn't work that way. So there's reasons why these things are popular in cities. So we talked about community as a theme, and this is, you know, this goes back through all of human history. People are really desperate sometimes to form community. They're social animals. We like being with other people for the most part. Okay, so when all these men, and I'm going to focus mostly on men because women's sports aren't really coming around yet. We'll talk about that a little later. These men are moving from the farms to the cities. Well, they're leaving their old relationships behind. You know, in those small towns, they might have known these people for decades or generations having the same families live in this town well now when they're moving from the small town of i don't know it's an example Pittman, for example to philadelphia well there's a whole lot of new people in philadelphia they don't know and that's a little frightening right you want to be able to form these new relationships form these new communities you don't want to be left alone out there okay and sports are a great way to accomplish this all right and one of the great reasons why, or one of the most important reasons why they're growing so fast is that they're part of these social clubs that are springing up, okay? It's mostly middle and upper middle class men. So it's guys who are going to the city to work as clerks, to work as lawyers, accountants, right? They might not have been born rich, but they're making a decent amount of money, okay? They're not necessarily working with their hands as much. They're not laborers, right? Uh, they're not at the lowest rung of society. These guys are saying, hey, we're meeting all these new people. We want to form some social clubs to form a better community. And in those social clubs, we're going to play sports. Okay. Now, in the sports they play in those clubs, it wasn't – at first, it wasn't about competition. Okay. It wasn't necessarily about who won or lost. Um, it was more about camaraderie and socializing. If we use the word today, they wouldn't have used this word probably. But our word would probably be networking. Right. The reason they played a baseball game in the social club was to network with other lawyers and other accountants and other whatever industries to figure out what was what they were doing to make themselves money, to figure out who they knew um, that could be helpful to this person's business, you know, to make more friends at the most basic level. OK, so it's about that networking, that socializing aspect more than the competition at first. But that changes and we'll see that come up. But who is it for? Like, who is sport for at this time? And I've mentioned, uh, I've given you several um, kind of uh, particularities. I'm not saying everybody's just coming doing sports here. Remember, I narrowed it down to men. You know, it wasn't see it was unseemly at this time for women to compete in sports. Women were thought to their place was to be in the home. Their bodies weren't able to handle the rigors of sport. 
their brains weren't able to handle the rigors of sport. That was with the idea at the time. Okay. Um, so not just for men, but usually white men who had money. Okay. Um, those were the guys entering these clubs. Those were the guys who could play these sports. Everybody else was kind of kept out, you know, now the people who were kept out, they could play it informally, but you know, uh, the teams that are going to start forming from these social clubs, they're not going to play them. Okay. Standardization. It's a good thing, right? If you standardize your rules, now a team from one city can play a team in another city and they agree in the rules. Where it's a bad thing for some people is that um, it means a new industry of sporting goods. Right? Oh, well, that's great. If you standardize the sport, now I can sell baseball gloves. Now I can sell baseball bats to people all across the country. Sorry, I got to keep confirming I'm on the call still. That means if it's standardized, I can sell the same equipment to everybody in the country because everybody plays the same way, right? And that sounds great. Well, we can have equipment to play the sport now. We can play it at a higher level. And in some ways, it is great. You know, you do want to play be able to play the sport at a higher level. That's awesome. But in some ways, it's not great because equipment costs money. And in the 1800s, we don't have the same standard of living as we have today. There were a lot more poor people in the 1800s. And the cost of that equipment is just too high for some people. So if you start having the sport where you need to have a chest protector to play catcher, if you need to have a helmet to play football, some people just can't afford that and they get left behind. Okay. Um, amateurism. I told you we use the word amateur a lot. And I don't know if we necessarily uh, understand what it means. Amateur, sometimes people use it to say, you know, like, oh, it's amateur hour here. As in to say, uh, nobody knows what they're doing. It's a lower level play. It's substandard. That's not actually what amateur means. Amateur simply uh, means you don't play for money. It's like the opposite of a professional. Professional does something for money. Amateur doesn't. And this is seen as a great thing, right? Even to the 20, even to now, a lot of people are like, ah, oh, the amateur ideal, that's the best. You're playing for the love of the game. You're not playing for money. That's the most ideal sportsman out there. But if you look a little bit below the surface, there's actually another reason why people are, you know, uh, celebrating amateurism. If you can play the game and you can dedicate yourself to playing this sport without making money for it, that means that you already have money that can support you in your life, right? That means you don't have to make money from this sport in order to stay living your lifestyle. It means you're independently wealthy, right? But a guy, a poor man who's maybe great at baseball, but he's poor, he needs to make money. So if the richer guys are saying, oh, no, we only take amateurs here. You cannot be a professional. You, you can't take money for the playing this game. Well, it's going to keep that poor guy out because he needs to work a job in order to make money to survive. OK, so amateurism really starts. And I don't think this is really controversial to say this. Amateurism starts as a way to exclude poor people from sports. It's a bunch of rich white guys saying, hey, we don't want you around here. Sports for us, not you. So we're going to see these debates uh, and closer looks at baseball and college football coming up. Uh, but I, I really want to drive that point home. Amateurism is put in by people in power to keep others out of sport. It's really what it's about. Despite that, despite the strong um, efforts of people in the upper men in the upper classes to keep sport only for the upper classes. Um, it be, starts to become professional. Okay. Professional meaning people play for money. Why? Well, a couple of reasons. One, just because people don't have the money to play, it doesn't mean they don't like it. <laughs> Sports are popular. They're fun, right? Everybody likes fun. Okay. So low, poorer people are interested in it. All right. If it's fun to people, if people enjoy it, well, then they're going to be willing to pay to watch it, right? If you enjoy doing something, you're going to spend a little bit of money on it if you care about it that much, right? So now it's going from just people playing it to now it's, oh, it's okay to watch it. Like spectatorship's cool. You know, you don't just have to partake in the sport to gain the benefits of it. You can watch it. So once people realize that, oh, you know, people are going to watch this sport. You know what? They're going to pay to watch this because they like it so much. Well, now I want to keep people coming back to the ballpark, right? I want people seeing the best product, product possible, which means I want to get the best players for my team. Because my team's bad, those fans will just go watch somebody else. So in order to keep the best players, sometimes you have to entice them. You have to induce them. And how do you do that? 
money. Now, at first, you start paying them under the table. Pe these teams don't want to be seen as giving people money because it's seen as against amateurism. People will be up in arms about it. But years pass, and people start becoming, yeah, you know what? We're making a lot of money on this. Let's just put it out in the open. Yeah, we're paying these guys. Absolutely, we're paying these guys. Come on, play for us so you can make us money. Okay. Uh, and so that's going hand in hand with competition, right? People aren't coming to see games where everybody's just like, you know, having a barbecue in the background and just hanging out, not really trying their best. No, like when you go to a football game, you want to see a guy throw a football 70 yards. You want to see dudes going all out, right? You want to see guys hit six threes in a game in basketball. So you're going to only willing to pay for that enjoyment if they're if you're actually getting the best product out there, if you're actually seeing healthy competition. So now competition with professionalization becomes more important than networking or socializing. OK, so I told you history is about change over time. We're starting to see that change right here in the mid 1800s. So the professionalization really starts in the 1850s and 1860s. Um, comes to baseball first because baseball is more popular at this time. First of all, football doesn't really exist in the 1850s, uh, but it does come to football later. And believe it or not, it does come to college sports, which might sound strange, but we'll get into that coming up. OK, so the sport's changing to be professional. People are willing to pay to watch it, which means you need to be more competitive to attract those fans, which means you have to start playing to win, which means you have to start paying players to make sure you have the best players to win. Right. You see how that's all related there. Speaking of college sport, intercollegiate sports are unique to America. That is fair to say. Any other country you go to, they do not have the same thing we do. They do not have a team from a college playing another team from another college in a competition. Now, they'll have sports within the college, intra, I-N-T-R-A. So, like, for instance, like intramural sports. Like, if we had, uh, if you, when you guys go to college in a few years, you'll have intramural sports where people in your dormitory may play people in another dormitory in basketball. That's common in other countries and colleges. But it's not common to have Notre Dame football play University of Michigan football. That just doesn't happen. That is unique to America. Um. The first college sport is rowing, as I mentioned. I think I said last lecture that the first really intercollegiate competition is the Harvard Yale boat race in 1852. That is still going on, by the way, the Harvard Yale boat race. It, I think it just was last weekend. Uh, this past Saturday, Yale won its fifth straight uh, over Harvard. Um, for those two schools, that race is even more important than the national championship. The national championship is about two weeks before this race. So Yale, which has won the national championship a couple times in recent years, if they won the national championship and then lost to Harvard a couple weeks later in the boat race, they would not be happy. That they would consider that season a failure, right? So that's important, really important to those schools. Um, and specifically with college sports, we're going to look most specifically at college football. Um, it's not to say other college sports aren't important, uh, but college football is the most prominent, the most profitable, the most debated all of these things um, of all college sports. Okay. All right. So we cover a lot of that material. Now let's talk about the stuff you're supposed to be submitting for work, right? For assignments. You don't have to answer this. There is no assignment for this discussion question on Canvas. You do not have to answer this. I put this on here as an example, a sample discussion question. Okay. So I might ask you after, at the end of one of these um, lessons, for instance, we've talked about the transition from games or pastimes to sports. We spent a lot of time talking about that. What do you think makes a sport a sport? You know, do you think it's the standardized rules? Do you think a sport means you have competitive matches and not friendly ones? Do you think you have to have standard equipment for it? Whatever criteria, right? And you take a stand on it. There's not one quote unquote right answer. The questions as I phrase them are not meant to be if you pick one side, you're wrong, the other side, you're right. There are very good arguments for either side. Now, this is not an either side question necessarily, but it still is making you pick evidence and support it. There will be other questions where it's basically, do you take this side or this side? Support your answer with evidence, right? Um, so in those discussion questions, you're going to make one post, make it a paragraph. Hey, Mr. Or you don't say my name, but hey, I think... Uh, uh, competitive matches are the most important thing that makes a sport a sport. And I'm going to spend five sentences telling you why. 
And everybody's going to make one of those posts. And then you have to respond to somebody's post. All right. So maybe somebody makes a point that you hadn't thought of. Say, oh, you know what? I like the way you think there. I disagree with you for this reason, but I'd never thought of it, for, uh, thought about it in this way. Right. So you make a post and then you're responding to somebody else's post. This might be a little bit more difficult, so I'm going to explain a little more. Um, primary source analysis. So I told you a lot of doing history is working with primary sources. Primary sources are sources from when the events happened. They're from the past. So, for instance, this painting is a primary source. It was painted in 1872 about things that were happening around 1872, right? So what do I mean by analysis? Well, I'm asking you to, again, this is a sample one. You're not doing this one in particular, and this one's a little bit harder. Than the ones you'd actually be doing but i'm asking you to say hey look at this text look at this painting look at this listen to this voice recording what does that tell you about this time period we're studying or this sport we're studying that doesn't just jump out and tell you that you have to read between the lines to understand you know so for instance this painting it's not jumping out and telling you hey white americans are coming forward on the continent and bringing civilization uh into the world and they're pushing out the native americans it doesn't explicitly say that however there are elements of this that tell you that well mr murphy it's dark on the side that all the indians and buffalo are leaving from but it's bright white on the side that the american the white americans are coming from which means you know the american side must be better because it's white against darkness that's way to analyze it you would say oh well look this angel which by the way that's like the angel of liberty columbia is stringing telegraph wire along the line and there's a train coming behind right and there's all this technology coming forward and it's pushing out the dark you know antiquated stuff from the past it's showing american progress literally the name of the painting is american progress but i just explained to you a way that i interpreted it that shows that that is progress okay so again this is a harder one but it's asking you to kind of read between the lines of that document and say hey what can this document tell us about this time period what can I learn about this sport and its place in America from this document? And usually I'll give you like a sentence to help guide you on those when I post them on uh, campus. Um, but that's the general gist of it. So hopefully um, that makes sense to you. And if it doesn't, please, please let me know. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. All right, good. The first, the first recording did. Um, did save. So I'll have to maybe split. I don't know if I'm not technologically savvy enough to splice these two together, but I'll just put them both on um, YouTube. So we covered a lot of information today. Um, hopefully it makes sense. If it doesn't, let me know. Email me. We'll figure it out. We can go on a Zoom meet. We can talk about it. Um, you don't have any work due this week. Okay. So you don't have any work due from the two uh, slideshows we just looked at. However, it's important to understand what I was talking about in those slideshows to do the work that's going to be due in the upcoming weeks. So for next week, by the end of next week, you will have a discussion question and a primary source analysis that you'll have to have due. Okay. And we'll talk about that more in the next video. Anyway, uh, again, if you have any questions, let me know. Uh, be sure to like. No, you don't have to like and subscribe. Uh, but hopefully you guys all found these videos okay. I saw that there were some of you have subscribed to it, and I saw the first video had did have. A decent amount of views so that's good that you guys are finding this um yeah so i'll be posting that next one for next week fairly soon uh just make sure and again this is june 14th as i'm recording this tuesday make sure to watch this by the end of this week um cool all right have a good rest of your night rest of your week and uh you'll be seeing me uh on youtube very shortly with another video all right i'm gonna stop recording now